Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So today in this lecture, we are going to look at uh, what is the position of women in science. We have seen uh, the women's position in industrial production and also the uh, and offices, typically bureaucratic offices. <clears throat> now we will see women in knowledge production by focusing on pattern of participation in science education and scientific research. One sees a trend that more women drop out of education at different levels and later on also now, in research, various stages of research, we will see uh, women's position in science as a, in a comparative perspective. How do they perform in different socio-cultural contexts? What I am going to present to you today is based on a paper that I wrote with Dr. Nagalakshmi, Department of Sociology, for a conference of the European Commission supported project we did during 2008 and 11 on ethics in science and technological responsibility. This project had one uh, component that is gender components in a very prominent way. So we really looked at the data about women's participation. Women in science, uh, we have seen, uh, I mentioned to you about glass ceiling effect that uh, women face invisible barrier in hierarchy that is called glass ceiling effect. It refers to inequalities at workplaces or workplace as a result of discrimination based on gender or based on color. A glass ceiling is an unseen, but yet it is an unbreachable barrier that halts the progress of women from raising to higher positions in an organization. Discrimination in promotions to higher levels in the, in the hierarchy is also an expression of this uh, glass ceiling effect. Science and the reward system, the Matthew effect and Matilda effect. See, I mentioned in my discussion on Robert Merton's contributions to sociology of science that he proposed uh, the way the rewards are distributed in science is not equitable, they are skewed. A few scientists get more and more rewards and this is what we call Matthew effect. Matthew effect consists in the accruing of greater increments of recognition for particular scientific contributions to scientists of considerable repute and the withdrawal or withholding of such recognition from scientists who have not yet made their mark. For example, Nobel laureates are highly recognized and they keep on getting recognized. They attract more funds, more students and they get employment in uh, highly reputed institutions and so on. So even though one of every four scientists in India is a woman, the largest pool of them remain at lower rungs of science. Growth in women entering science is visible, gender gap remains still large participation at higher levels in academic careers across the world. Attrition of women at higher levels has been described as leaky pipeline. That is more and more women drop out of this higher education and uh, uh, research and also uh, the more of the scientific uh, positions in scientific organizations. Science and the reward system, where we talked about Matthew effect, but in the case of women, another effect operates that's called Matilda effect. The Matilda effect is as follows. Rositer uh, in her study proposed that many women in science have been marginalized and that due credit is not given to them. Many examples of how women scientists lose out in the process and do not receive credit and recognition are there in the history of science. Names, uh, Rositer names this after American Matilda J. Gage a writer and published extensively on women's suffrage and women in history or technology. Now, let me give an example how the Matilda effect uh, operates in science. See, we are all familiar with Rosalind Franklin who contributed uh, most significant, very significant work in trying to arrive at the double helical structure of the DNA. Uh, Rosalind, Rosalind Franklin worked on the DNA molecule from 1951 to 1953. Her crystallography and photographs of the B version of the molecule were shown by her co-worker, Mr. Wilkins, 
to James Watson. Watson and Francis Kick, James Watson and Francis Kick were working independently on the structure of DNA and Watson realized that these photographs were the scientific evidence they needed to pro prove that the DNA molecule was a double helical uh, structure or double standard helix. Watson and Crick, Watson, Crick and Wilkins were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1962, four years after Franklin died. So, credit was not shared with her. She was not given the credit that was due to her. Her work was not even acknowledged. Watson dismissed her work. Later, Crick acknowledged discrimination against women, access to, in fact, in those laboratories, women had limited access to dining rooms and so on. I mentioned that science, there is a lot of informality in science, a uh, lot of informal networks operate in science uh, from which uh, for, uh, networks operate in science for which women do not have access. For example, sometimes old buddy network works in the sense uh, all male scientists get together, meet informally, exchange a lot of views on what they are doing and uh, also get some ideas during the course of conversations. And this uh, kind of access to women to informal groups is almost limited or negligible. Informal networks with men is uh, very, very uh, limited and even among women it is not really significant. Now let us uh, talk about women in science in India. There are two dimensions to the issue of women in science in India. One, getting more women to study science and technology. Second, ensuring that those who study are able to pursue career in science and technology. If you look at the table R&D statistics, sources NSTMIS division of the Department of Science and Technology. The NSTMIS stands for National Science and Technology Management Information System, which is a division of the Department of Science and Technology. They found that the total number of PhDs, if you look at natural sciences, uh, that was in 2005, uh, 661 were uh, PhDs and total PhDs were 1,296. So, this is the uh, number of, I mean, this uh, table gives you some idea about uh, the kind of uh, numbers that are involved uh, in, in science education, but we'll go to the, go and see how women are faring in this. Okay, this is the data about where uh, postgraduates, PhDs, graduate students, diploma holders are employed in different uh, fields. And, uh, and if you look at decadal growth in women's enrollment in India, uh, Indian National Science Academy study, which was conducted by Indian National Academy or supported by Indian National Academy. Science career for Indian women is like as follows. 1950-51, total number of scientists were 3,96,745 out of which 10.9% 10 10 were women. And uh, 1970, it went up to 22%. Uh, 1991, it went up to 29%. And 2000 to 2001, it went up to 39.4%. So, look at the science career for women. If you look at the data, percentage of enrollment of women at various levels in different faculties. For example, uh, in arts, that is social sciences, the 44% were uh, enrolled in graduate program, 44.7% in, uh, in, in, in the uh, postgraduate program. And in PhD, out of total number of uh, PhD enrollments, 38%, 38.6% for women. So, sciences out of, uh, again, graduate studies, that is undergraduate study, 39 out of 39% uh, and again postgraduate 42.5% in PhD, it was 37.2% of total enrollment for women. Engineering and technology, this is what has been traditionally uh, a concern where less women uh, are enrolled in, 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 in these programs. Of course, it is now changing. In 2001 and 2000 to 2001, it was 21.8 in graduate and undergraduate that is BE, BTEC, postgraduate 15.8 percent and PhD 16.5 percent. So, medicine has been always uh, a preferred profession for women. That is why you see 
45 percent uh, at undergraduate level, 34 percent at postgraduate level, and 29 percent, 29.3 percent at, uh, at at the level of PhD. Agriculture, uh, of course, recently the numbers have been increasing, but traditionally agriculture was not a preferred stream for women because people thought it involves a lot of field work and a lot of going out of the uh, town or the city where they're studying and so on. So undergraduate study was 17 percent, 18 percent was postgraduate, 18.8 uh, was postgraduate uh, enrollment for women and 14.6 percent of women of total enrollment and PhD or women. Similarly, veterinary science also uh, was once considered not a desirable profession for women. That's why these numbers, undergraduate study 21.6 percent, postgraduate 18.6 and PhD 14.5 percent. So science career for women, <clears throat> you see that most of the women uh, tend to move into academic organizations, academic institutions. And there is some data which uh, tells us what is the kind of uh, representation of women in uh, R&D institutions. For example, CSR has 13 percent women scientists, DBT has 31.8 percent, ICMR has 27.3 percent, and Department of Atomic Energy 16.5, Department of Ocean, Department of uh, ocean development has 8.7 percent and ICR has 10.4 percent which is ICR is Indian Council for Agricultural Research that we see a uh, number as I said uh, some of agriculture profession is not somehow preferred profession for women. Okay, then uh, IISC that is premier scientific institution has about 6.6 percent women and in the Scientific technical staff 9.7 percent women. University of Hyderabad is 15.1, 15.8 percent. Now the numbers have changed. It's slightly old data, and I'm sure this trend indicates. But the increases were marginal, and not uh, 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 increases were not very high, but they're only marginal increases. The Indian National Science Academy study. Uh, achievements and recognition of women scientists uh, in India. Uh, the, the study said ability to secure permanent faculty position attract research grants. Research scholars, publications and patents, invitations to conferences, travel fellowships, invitations to be, to invi invitation to be on various policy making and review committees, awards, academy fellowships, Require, uh, requires scientist visibility and recognition by peers. The criteria of uh, recognition, all the, uh, as I just now mentioned, they should be able to secure permanent faculty positions, they should attract research grants, they must attract research scholars, and they must publish, also get patents for their work, and they should get invitations, and so on. Let's see what happens to women. Uh, <clears throat> see, the if you look at the data, we see that total fellowships in the uh, that was uh, given by according to study, the seven, seven, 744 out of which only were the persons who got the fellowship. Indian Academy of Sciences Bangalore out of 80, 80, 841 fellowships, only 4.5% were women. National Academy of Agricultural Sciences uh, out of 395 fellowship travel uh, fellowships, only 4.4% 4 .4 were women candidates. Now, what is the empirical evidence? There was a study, as I said, this is done by uh, Anita Kurup from uh, NIAS Bangalore, sponsored by Indian Academy of Sciences. And it's based on a study, a survey of women in research and women not in research, women not working. So, the survey was conducted among 568 scientists, 312 women engaged in science, science research, women in research. 182, 182 women not engaged in positions other than long-term science research, that is women not in research. The includes women in undergraduate teaching, temporary positions, consultancy or administrative positions. Seven, four, seven, 74 uh, women were not working. The methodology was a pre-coded questionnaire was administered, approximately 100 questions. 161 men scientists were included as a comparative group. 
personal family details, education, employment, origin, organizational details were collected, productivity data, or how much they produced, how many papers they produced was also collected, and also the study used interviews with the scientists to uh, sort of support the kind of uh, statistical uh, data they collected. So, the reasons for women scientists not taking up jobs. So, the graph shows it is self explanatory women in research and women not in research is an interesting uh, uh, group where according to them they, they do not see better prospects, professional prospects and so on. And uh, uh, the women in research also one uh, significant number is uh, the category of did not get the job for a long time. Okay? So, obviously this number is very high. A, for women not working and women not in research it is also high. So, this is uh, the pattern of distribution of the responses that the study obtained. So, what does it mean? Factors responsible for the lower number of recruitments and advancement of advancement for women not getting the job is related to degree of transparency of selection and evaluation procedures. That is women wait for a very long time to get jobs and uh, sometimes it becomes so frustrating some of them opt out and some of them look for temporary jobs and uh, so on. It is one of the factors that is, is that is related to the kind of this situation is the, the degree of transparency of selection procedures and evaluation procedures. Second institutions need to state clear criteria in selection procedure to ensure transparency and improve confidence of women to apply for the post or positions. They also may be related to the lack of jobs. Basically, if you look at the situation today, Indian academic institutions, several institutions have been opened. For example, we have uh, new central universities, every state has one, new IITs, every state has one IIT, and new IIMs, every state has one IIM. All these institutions must be having a lot of vacancies, but somehow Many of the administrators of these universities uh, with whom I interacted say that they are not able to number one get positions from the uh, positions sanctioned from the UGC and those positions which are sanctioned are not also being filled. One of course is a problem to get quality faculty and uh, if you do not get quality faculty uh, there is no point in appointing uh, people who do not have uh, quality and potential for good research. Of course, we are st stuck in this position of uh, with several academic institutions, but not being able to fill all the vacancies that are there. You, recently, the MHRD also said, had given a data about all the central universities, the about the vacancies, and the MHRD said the, the universities must fill up these positions as fast as possible. But basically, uh, it takes a long time to uh, do recruitment in the universities because of various procedures and at the end we also the universities also look for some quality faculty. <clears throat> Time spent in research, men in research and women in research, if you look at the comparison, see this is per week, right? Average number of working hours per week reported by uh, women in research and men in research. For example, uh, if you look at the red stands for men in research, you will see that <coughs> uh, the blue stands for women in research. Uh, men, more men spend 70 hours of time of the time in a week for research and more or less equal uh, is 60 to 70 hours men and women spend. But we see 40 to 60 hours category, uh, women outnumber men and 20 to 40 hours research, men outnumber women and so on. Uh, so, this is the pattern of distribution and one may spend a lot of time uh, uh, in, in research, but ultimately what matters is what is the uh, outcome of this uh, time spent on research. Right? Men in research and women in research, despite family and childcare responsibilities, women work in different ways to 
in the ideally required number of 8 to 10 hours per day for research. That they have been doing almost all institutions. Quality of research not known. Findings disprove the myth that women cannot provide enough time for work and research after marriage, uh, childbirth and family responsibilities because of these factors. There is a popular kind of a belief that women, because they are, they are supposed to play dual roles, one, the professional role at the workplace in scientific organization and the role of a care provider at home, this dual responsibilities really uh, make, her, make it difficult for her to devote more time for her research work. But the evidence shows in this study that the average they spend to they spend eight to ten hours per day uh, in research. Reasons for dropping out of science, if you see, I said as women move uh, to higher levels of education, there's a tendency for them to drop out. <clears throat> so, what are these reasons for women dropping out? The blue indicates family commitments the blue color and then the brown indicates social cultural factors, green indicates organizational factors and purple indicates insufficient jobs and the blue indicates the lighter blue indicates lucrative career opportunities etc. options etc. Now what it means is that in the case of women it is the family responsibility, family commitments which are responsible for them to drop out of uh, research. Uh, <clears throat> These are perceived reasons by men and women. And there are other factors which also hamper their continuation in, in uh, scientific work. Men in research and women in research, largely prevalent concept, preconception among men. Domestic responsibilities hinder optimal performance of women in science. There is also lack of recognition awarded to commitment and ability of women to manage multiple responsibilities, utility for the utility of organizational facilities in aiding their management of career and family. That the women, because of domestic respon responsibilities, they are not able to reach optimal uh, performance levels and they are not also able to uh, use the organizational facilities. If you look at the uh, comparison between India and other countries in terms uh, in regarding uh, trained scientific women power, how much are we losing and why? Uh, if you look at 2000, it's a 2010 data, old data, maybe things have slightly improved now. Country-wise attrition of women in physics. So in India, 37% of women students enrolled in physics drop out at, after undergraduate level. Then of those enrolled in graduate level, that is post uh, MSCM level, 20% drop out after that and professional level 11% drop out of uh, scientific work. Whereas the numbers are very different for other countries. For example, in UK it is only 20% drop out at the end of undergraduate course, 19% at the end of uh, graduate course and ni only 9% drop out at the professional level. Similarly, France uh, as France is more, is more or less comparable to India uh, and USA 20% uh, drop out at the end of graduate de undergraduate degree and 15 at the end of graduate degree and 10% at the end of the uh, end of the uh, uh, in PhD, right? So trained scientific manpower, how much are we losing and why? As I said, the numbers showed a comparative uh, picture. Need for policies to refrain from developing blanket provisions. Do not meet the needs of all women scientists, but address needs of those already in science. Differences seen in different age cohorts indicate the need to recognize decision making or standing committees at national state level to include younger age groups. Basically, uh, <clears throat> they are not able to represent on committees, on decision making bodies, so that they can make a difference to uh, 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 science. There is another study which, uh, uh, which is titled Gendered, Gendered Science, again in INSA study. According to this study, 
the general scenario points out that higher literacy rate of a state, a greater wisdom, awareness among masses regarding choice of appropriate career for themselves uh, is an important uh, factor. Women pursuing a science career, reaching out to uh, higher positions in the cadre, in their career, could be few and far between. That is the story same that women, uh, uh, women raising in the hierarchy, uh, women moving up in the hierarchy is somehow uh, still a problem. So again, the INSA study says, many women have done exceedingly well in their scientific and academic pursuits. Not many are seen being awarded or rewarded. As predicted by the statistics, approximately over 90% of the cases, women scientists believe in collaboration as indicated by the authorship pattern. See, although women do a lot of work, scientific work, somehow in terms of the rewards and recognition, they are not comparable, uh, they're not comparable to the kind of situation that we have among male scientists. See, if you look at the publication pattern, uh, if you will see the following pattern, that is proportion of, uh, B, proportion of women as second author is less. Women scientists are generally appearing as first or second author in the study that they have done. It also depends on the projects that uh, a particular laboratory takes up, particular scientist takes up. That decides uh, who is the principal author, corresponding author, and who are the other collaborating authors. Hence, generalizations like leading research front at different levels cannot be overlooked. That is, women also uh, <clears throat> uh, publish a lot and they are all part of the collaborative research. According to this, around 15 to 20 percent contributions come from women scientists irrespective of the uh, proportion in organization. Right? That is, 15 to 20 percent of total publications in academic institutions come from women scientists uh, irrespective of the proportion means if a institute has 100, uh, and women are 20, they would publish 20 percent of the publications. Similarly, if the uh, institute has scientists, uh, if the number of scientists is, is again about 100, uh, they would publish about 15 to 20 percent of the publications. The indicators point towards a very important aspect that in terms of the output, women scientists are fairly uh, standing at a reasonably uh, virtuous platform with whatever putative limitations where input indicators are far from matching levels. That is, although they are, in con they, they are, um, what should I say, that their existential conditions hamper or hinder their participation in science, they are able to do, uh, overcome these limitations placed by existential conditions and uh, publish their work, participate in scientific activity. <coughs> See, putative factors influencing science uh, career for women uh, can be attributed to a personal or family, uh, family commitments, motherhood, and inadequate support systems. Second, soci societal cultural factors that could be due to fixed mindset, restriction on movement, nepotism, and sexism. Uh, as I said, these things are changing right now. I mean, there's a lot more recognition that women must be uh, encouraged to continue in science. In the last lecture, I mentioned that the Department of Science and Technology has several, uh, some programs which want to get women who are married, not working, again, get them back into uh, uh, research work by providing scholarships and uh, uh, encouraging them to pursue career. So, the Family commitments, as I said, one of the putative factors is, see, in India, the family is undergoing enormous transition. So we do not have the kind of, uh, I mean, we all are used to hearing the fact that 50 years ago, India had what is the, inst the institution was a joint family where several people lived in the same household and there's a lot of support systems for uh, people. But those days, of course, women were not really, uh, 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 encouraged to go for higher education and so on. But now as they move on to higher education, the joint family system has we almost disappeared as a, uh, as, a, as a dwelling unit. So, but brothers and, you know, uh, a joint family is defined as 
all the male uh, property owners or co-partners and the uh, dependents. And if the brothers are scattered uh, across the country, they may meet once in a while. But as a living unit, dwelling unit, the joint family has uh, almost disappeared in our country. And this means that now um, typically a family consists of wife, husband, and their children. And if a woman happens to be a scientist or working mother, the burden is quite a lot on her to, uh, as I said, to play the two roles, one the professional role at the workplace and the role of a caregiver at, the, uh, at home. There are problems of role uh, conflicts. Of course, today the situation is changing because uh, we have a lot more gadgets to help people at home to, uh, to use and minimize their drudgery. And slowly men also are trying to uh, uh, trying to uh, put in some labor at home to help uh, the spouses. So, for example, uh, at home, of course, there's a lot of load on women. But at the workplace, if a woman has a young, of course, one of the important interventions that the government has made in our country is to give two years of paid leave for women if they have children, right? They can take this leave any time of the uh, career and, uh, and this leave is paid for and it's basically to take care of the children. I think that's a big kind of uh, intervention. That's a very uh, uh, useful intervention by the government and which will encourage women to continue their work. And, and this, this leave it can, be, is, it can be applied by uh, working mothers especially in government organizations, when the children are young and when the children need most attention by, when the children need uh, most attention by the mothers. So that way we are, we are making incremental interventions to see that women also uh, endow or also enrolled in science education and they continue in science, science education and they also continue in the uh, scientific profession as researchers and uh, teachers. If you, if you look at the professional growth of women, uh, career advancement shows that 33% of scientists and 28% students were not satisfied. So they are not uh, basically the 33% uh, of women scientists and 28% of women students are not satisfied uh, with the kind of a, uh, career advancement. See, uh, this career advancement is linked to the number of positions that are available in the uh, organization and the number of uh, uh, positions that are given by the uh, funding bodies uh, to the universities to every five-year plan. Uh, normally, our university grants commission, especially for universities, gives faculty positions once in five years. And these positions have to be uh, sort of filled by the universities. There is always a gap between what the universities require uh, and what the UGC grants, whether it is funds, whether it's faculty members, whether it is uh, 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 funds towards infrastructure facilities and so on. So that's why the, the gap continues uh, year after year, plan after plan. <clears throat> and the reason cited were lack of time, or lack of time, household responsibilities, Organizational organization did not encourage ill health, lack of finance, etc. for students, perhaps attributed to impact of globalization, privatization, and so on. Uh, we have seen that this kind of uh, privatization also is going to impact our scientific uh, institutions, uh, universities, and R&D institutions, uh, because the tendency on the part of on, in the current ten, trend is to uh, uh, encourage a lot of private institutions to come, to come into the educational sector. And it's already been happening. Some states have already introduced what is called private universities bills, which enable, or which enable private uh, organizations to start uh, universities to impart uh, education. And we already have seen that private organizations which start academic institutions tend to be very selective, tend to open only certain branches of knowledge, and uh, that means they are restricted. They would like to, normally the trend is that they open branches of, uh, or departments, academic departments, uh, which have a lot of 
uh, market potential. If if graduates, if people graduate out of these departments, they have a lot of market potential, job potential. That is engineering departments and management. Whereas a university must be a more, it should be seen as a site of liberal education, which should include, which should have all branches of knowledge, engineering, sciences, social sciences, and humanities like philosophy, English literature, and so on, literature of regional languages. Then perhaps the students uh, can have uh, opportunities to pursue courses. And of course, the recent trend is to introduce what is called choice-based credit system. This should enable the students to pick up courses from any branch of knowledge. And for that to happen, universities must be very, very liberal uh, in terms of their, uh, 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 in terms of number of branches of uh, knowledge they have, number of departments they have, where these departments provide opportunities for students to uh, pursue uh, courses of their interest. That is, the science students should be able to do courses in social sciences and perhaps in literature. And similarly, a social science student, if he is interested, if he has all that kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 capability, should be allowed to do courses in management studies, courses in mathematics, and so on. University where the lot of uh, uh, students are given opportunities to do some courses in different uh, uh, departments or academic branches or different disciplines, I would say, uh, that if uh, this is what will promote interdisciplinary teaching and research. So today's most of the real world problems today are re uh, interdisciplinary in nature. They are, uh, the, see the world does not divide itself. We divide the world, social world into economic sphere, political sphere and uh, social sphere, cultural sphere. But otherwise, they are quite interrelated. I said that the universities must offer a wide range of uh, disciplines, wide range of subjects for students to uh, choose from. And then only we will be able to train, provide uh, education, liberal education, true sense of the word. So. Uh, So if you look at, uh, again, how, what is the level of, uh, for example, women's interest in, in uh, career, pursuing career, the INSA study shows, the study shows that 35% of, 35.6% scientists said had denied themselves career options and 22.7% of such denial affected adversely their career. That is sometimes they, uh, women voluntarily uh, uh, deny the, uh, voluntarily opt out of uh, opportunities or options, and then that can affect them in long, uh, long term uh, career. 20.3% of the respondents being denied promotion. They were not given promotion. That also affects their morale. Among them, 42.3% attributed it to gender bias, and 50% to lack of connections. So mostly, see, the always the recruitment uh, is always a very, very uh, <clears throat> Difficult process in any organization, especially in public institutions, uh, and there is always a possibility of, of uh, <clears throat> people complain of this kind of biases, and uh, this should be overcome by making this recruitment process more transparent and more uh, effective. See, 50% of women scientists also said uh, they're, they have limited recognition and also they said uh, there is appropriation of their work by male colleagues. Now, this is a serious kind of a question. Uh, why is it that women don't get recognition? And why is it that they are able to part with this, their contributions or work which are used by the male counterparts? Now, this is a more of an organizational question, I would say, later on organization. It's also ethical question in the sense that it's unethical to uh, appropriate others' work. It's a professional misconduct, and that should be discouraged. And similarly, uh, not giving 
uh, recognition that is due to people is uh, also not uh, fair. It is injustice. That should be also addressed. That should also be addressed uh, appropriately. So I think uh, one of the important points that is that emerged, which I said in my earlier lecture also, that the way science is organized today, the way scientific organizations are structured, the way science is produced, uh, has uh, evolved over time, which uh, in the initial stages, women were not really part of this kind of uh, participation. And it is changing today. And the, the most important uh, thing that uh, is being said is, if women want to su succeed in science, they must be like men. They must work like men, in the sense, uh, and they, they should not really look at their family commitment. They should not look at the other existential conditions, but they should always uh, work like men who have that liberty of ignoring these family responsibilities or, or, or not paying uh, enough time to this, uh, and so on. So basically, what it means is, Women should be like men in order to succeed in science. It also uh, is the fact that women require certain kind of, uh, at certain times of the, uh, their life, certain times of their uh, life, uh, some kind of uh, staggering of work, some kind of uh, less load of work because of their, perhaps they are uh, on the family way or they have small infants to look after and so on. So there are. Uh, situations like this and that has to be addressed properly and what we should say here is uh, men and women are different but they're equal that is they are thinking beings women can also think like men women can also reflect like men women can also become creative writers like men so they're equal in this sense but because they're biologically different they should not be they should not be uh, treated uh, differently, they should not be. It should not be said because they are biologically different; they are unequal. They are equal uh, <clears throat> socially, but they may be unequal. They may be different biologically, in the sense the biological differences should not come in the way of uh, women. Uh, come in the way of recognizing women's work, women's creativity, women's potential. It is in this context uh, people are now talking about. Uh, alternative paradigm, uh, this is called women's science. Earlier we said women in science, but today people are talking about women's science. In science, it's possible to discern a phenomenon from various perspectives or standpoints. I said in my earlier lectures that there is a possibility of plurality of perspectives to conceptualize a particular phenomenon. There is a plurality of ways in which one can describe the world, uh, describe the phenomena. And uh, this is an important kind of a, uh, uh, epistemological position where one can look at the world very differently. It is this which provides an opportunity or it creates a possibility of women to conceptualize nature differently and thus leading to a different theory of knowledge and theoretical formulations. The, the claim that is being made here is, Women look at the world differently, and they can always conceptualize the world very differently. The, and they can produce new knowledge, new uh, theories of knowledge, and new knowledge as uh, new knowledge about the world. The, uh, this position comes from the fact that all along, science was done by men, and science was uh, scientific phenomena were conceptualized for conceptualized by men, and uh, Men have a different way of looking at the world, and that's how we have a particular knowledge system today, which is which is predominantly conceptualized by men. The other, the position that is being proposed here, the, the argument that is being proposed here is, women conceptualize nature differently, or the world differently, and thus leading, they can produce different kind of knowledge about the world, and they can uh, perhaps create new theoretical uh, foundations about uh, the world. So, following from this, the fact that women conceptualize the world differently, also that theory building and methods in scientific analysis by women 
are not the same as those of men. That is, they will have different theories, different methodologies, and uh, they will produce different kind of knowledge. Now, this is a position which is being, uh, this is a position being proposed by, or this is an argument being proposed by feminist theorists who say that women have uh, uh, <clears throat> capability, they have creativity, creative potential to look at the world differently, to produce new theories and so on. All along, they have been part of this uh, conceptualization that was produced by men. They are part of the scientific organization or scientific knowledge production, which was predominantly produced by men. The one of the important authors is Sandra Hardings, who Sandra Harding, who observes that increasing presence of women in science fields has been benefited both the science and the cause of women. That is, as I said some time back, if the number of women increase in an organization, uh, for example, scientific organization or industrial organization, the <coughs> it go, it's going to benefit both the organization and the uh, and also women. That is, more and more women must really get enrolled in science, continue science education, or also continue to do professional work in science. Which, of course, as we said just now, the data shows there is there's been a dropout rate uh, at different levels. People, have, women have been dropping out at different stages in education. What's being said here is, on the other hand, there must, the number of women must increase uh, in all the organizations. Uh, industry, scientific, industrial, scientific, and uh, uh, other organizations. The presence of significant, significant number of women, the presence of significant numbers of women in a field often increases its legitimacy and the value of its work in the public perception. What is being claimed here is, if there are more number of women in a particular field, that field itself will acquire more recognition, reputation in the eye of the public, in public perception. So, uh, for example, if you look at nursing profession today, uh, most of the nurses are women, 90 percent. Of course, there are male nurses, but the number of nurses in medical profession, so the nurses are women, and uh, <clears throat> because they are women, uh, nurses have high, uh, nursing profession high value, high respect, because uh, they have the ability to give care the ability to, uh, to, to uh, handle things very diligently, handle uh, patients very, uh, very, very, uh, with a lot of human care, human understanding and so on. So that is why uh, you see nursing profession is dominated by women. Uh, that is one kind of a perception uh, people say that uh, <clears throat> uh, women, one, this is one of the theoretical positions in feminist studies that women are supposed to be caregivers. They are caregivers and uh, they provide nurture, right? So this is the reason why uh, certain professions women are uh, preferred. But there is also criticism against this, which will not, will not go into that. Alternate epistemology has implications for knowledge generation, development of technology, for the evolution of our science. See, if uh, women conceptualize the world differently, they produce a different kind of knowledge, will also have different kind of technologies. See, uh, <clears throat> typically if you see uh, how women organize things, definitely there is a difference between how they organize and how men organize, right? So I think if that is also allowed to, uh, that is also allowed in the practice of science, perhaps things will be very different. You will have a different kind of uh, knowledge and different kind of technological options. Women science, Sandra Harding, the feminine observation and perception of phenomena, especially in health and environment are not the same as those of men. I said just now, uh, feminine observation that and perceptions of phenomena, especially in the health and environment are not the same as, the, as those of men. That is, how do women look at health? How do women look at environment? This is very, very different from the way men look at health and environment. That is what is being claimed. So women have uh, an understanding of what it means to be healthy because they are involved in childbearing and child rearing and they know what it means to uh, 
bring up a person, what it means to bring up a child in a healthy condition. And that's why they have a very different perception of what is health. Similarly, they have a different uh, notion of environment. Uh, they are uh, basically, their views are very different from that of men and this may be very useful to, uh, to protect environment and also to uh, uh, <clears throat> in adapting to our uh, climate change uh, and of course mitigation of the impact of climate change. I think it's very, very important that we develop a women's perspective on environment and, uh, uh, and women develop a perspective on environment and it is recognized and used in various uh, <clears throat> In, in, uh, in organizing uh, interventions uh, to protect the environment. These are areas that affect them most and hence their capabilities of observed, capability to observe and understand them are of significance to the advancement of research in these areas. As I said, um, because number one I said women are the ones, women are the ones who uh, have uh, knowledge how to sort of take care of an infant, how to take care of a baby and they also are aware of uh, uh, the problems that uh, the health problems that women face and uh, this understanding men can never gain or men at least uh, the claim is that they will never have the understanding, same understanding as women have about women's health. This is uh, an important observation and that should be recognized. And similarly, environment, they know what the nature gives to sustain a particular household, at least in traditional communities. Uh, women know what the, na what the nature uh, around them, around their households offer to them and they know how to protect this. And uh, that's what is being claimed. Such knowledge is of relevance in emerging economies such as India and Africa. As I said, this was, paper was written as part of our conference uh, that, uh, that was related to our European Commission project on ethics in science and technological responsibility. The, for example, uh, the, there is a cognitive diversity in the scientific process and this needs to be recognized. This includes the women's ability to apply scientific method and processes. Because as I said, when I say there are multiplicity of ways in which you can conceptualize the world, there are plurality of ways in which you can conceptualize the world, it means there is a cognitive diversity. There is a different um, ways of understanding the world. That is diversity in knowing the world. Cognition means the act of knowing and uh, that cognitive diversity means uh, the diversity in knowing, in knowing the world, right? Uh, that means um, they should be able to apply scientific method. Perhaps a new methodology may be, uh, may be evolved because you, have, you look at the world very differently. In, I quote, in societies where women are responsible for local agriculture, animal husbandry, and forestry, they develop repositories of knowledge about their environment that is continually tested and revised as the environmental and social conditions of their work change. This is Sandra Harding. What it means, if you look at uh, women, they closely, they live very close to the environment which includes flora and fauna. Uh, for example, agriculture, animal husbandry, forestry. Uh, they, women develop a lot of uh, uh, a repository of knowledge about this. For example, let me give an example. Uh, if you look at in the past, it is women who are involved in selecting the seed and preserving the seed uh, for next season. For example, if a crop is cult if a crop is harvested, the next thing that they should do is they should be able to pick up seed which can be used for the next season. In this process, it's it's women who are involved in this and they have been doing it for ages and uh, that means they are involved in selecting the best kind of seed and preserving it over time, over centuries, right? This is an important contribution that women made to agriculture and that's true of uh, many horticultural plants 
many uh, plants that produce flowers and so on. So, in this sense, uh, it should be recognized. Uh, so, we should only, the society will only benefit by recognizing this kind of knowledge and using it for the uh, benefit of society. Uh, Lalita, is, Lalita Subramanian is a, wrote a book on science, uh, women in science in India. She observes that women, women view their work with emotion and passion. Their interest is more cognitive. They view it as a means for self-fulfillment, ego satisfaction and personal success and not as an end in itself. Okay. So basically, they are... Uh, <clears throat> they pursue whatever they do with uh, emotion and passion. They also have a lot of cognitive interests and that should be uh, recognized. As I said, this is, in, uh, this is in contrast to the popular perception earlier we had about women. Uh, earlier people had about women that they are more emotional than logical. They are not suitable to do certain kinds of uh, uh, pursue uh, uh, certain kind of disciplines like mathematics and engineering, that is also that this perception is changing. That, as I said, if you recognize women are different but equal, that women also can think, they can create, they can really reflect, they can think of producing new objects, new uh, create new situations. Then obviously they will be part of this. Uh, their, their their contribution will for the betterment of society will be greater, and that should be encouraged. I said uh, women had a lot of contribution to make in conservation of biodiversity, as I said, in the selection of the seed, in trying to protect certain plant varieties, certain uh, medicinal plants and so on. So what should be done to see the women are encouraged to continue to enroll in science disciplines and continue to uh, go up the higher education, continue to reach the higher education levels and also continue to work. Uh, in professional organizations like scientific organizations and continue to do research. Now, this is very, very important. Of course, it requires uh, <clears throat> intervention at all these levels. What can policy do to see that, uh, how to, to see how to retain women at different levels of education and at different levels of scientific organizations and also to uh, see how women are given equal opportunities uh, equal recognition in the organization. That's an important question that at the level of organization people should think and at the level of policy it should be clearly stated that uh, of course our constitution recognizes men and women are equal but it should be really endorsed and practiced in every organization. Uh, I think as I said cognitive diversity is something extremely useful, extremely interesting kind of a, uh, 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 possibility of uh, looking at the world and see uh, how one can really uh, build a world which is uh, which which is uh, fair, just fair, just, and also environmentally uh, uh, environmentally. Oh, let it rephrase. Let me rephrase that cognitive diversity is something which should be encouraged, which will really uh, create a possibility of uh, uh, creating a better world, understanding things uh, <clears throat> in a better manner and, uh, and also achieving uh, results which are going to be useful to build a uh, just, equitable and, uh, and environmentally uh, safe society. Thank you very much. Okay, before saying thanks, I would like to make one more statement. Loss of women power from science is a major loss to trained resource. This is difficult to compensate in financial terms, a point that the society and the politics should remember. In the sense, if you lose a lot of people who are trained, a lot of money has been invested in their training, and if they move out of the uh, uh, out of this uh, education stream, research stream, is going to be lost to the government, not only to the individual but also the government for public sec public resources. And this should be remembered and to see how to encourage women to continue their presence in science. 
In conclusion, let me say alternate ways of conceptualizing research problems in science discipline needs encouragement, that is to promote cognitive diversity and possibilities of different kind of innovations because if there is a cognitive diversity, there is also possibility of different kinds of innovations coming up which are environment friendly, which are, uh, which are, which are compatible or uh, which are, which represent uh, um, climate resilience, climate resilience technologies, climate res resilience um, in, in uh, science scientific knowledge and climate resilient technologies can be produced. Today, climate change is an important uh, kind of an issue that we all should mu must address. Uh, we must really move into a different kind of a knowledge system. We must move into different kinds of technological regime, which uh, tries to uh, <clears throat> protect our environment. It is in this context we must encourage cognitive diversity and women can play a significant role in, 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 in uh, producing this in, in contributing to the diversity as decisions on science and technology policies are political in nature and hence linked to power relations it is important that women as political subject exercise her agency in the political realm. I said ultimately all decisions today in a democratic country are political decisions and women if they are involved in political decision making process they can facilitate a lot of uh, things which can go in favor of women which can go in favor of uh, uh, making women participate in, in scientific uh, education, uh, enroll in scientific education and participate in research. And I would like to mention demographically if the proportion of women in science increases to say 30 to 50 percent, uh, power balance will change and then a qualitative turn will occur towards women's science and uh, 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 women's science and science in general. In the sense, if the number increases, then you will see the changes in the way science is organized, perhaps the way science is done, and uh, we may produce a, a different kind of uh, knowledge, different kind of innovations, uh, which are uh, different from what we have today. So, thank you very much.